Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm, I was thrilled to receive this invitation to come here and speak to people in South Africa. And uh, I'm, I'm even more honored to speak to people who really inspired me during my career and who are references for me. Uh, Adrienne, Michael, of course, uh, Carlos, Mugendi, uh, Professor Alpai, I don't know where he is, but uh, really inspirations to me and when I started studying and when I started working. So uh, I'm, I'm really, really honored to be here. I hope I'll be able to show you uh, some of my work, my recent work, since I moved back to Brazil. And, uh, and I hope to be able to show you some uh, of, uh, of the research that I, I did in the UK and I applied uh, through these years. And uh, so I, I'm hoping to bring you something new during this speech. Let's go. Well, I'm coming from Brazil. And uh, you know it's a country uh, marked by contrasts. Uh, we have beautiful scenery, beautiful landscape, uh, beautiful resources. Uh, we don't have much of a plan. We, I think make a plan is a great line for Brazil. That's what I'm going to show you. We have lots of colors. It's great, but really the plan is lacking over there. Well, recently we had the World Cup. And uh, you had, you, you had the, the World Cup here as well recently. So I think it may be quite fresh on your minds. Uh, you probably experienced the same as us, with lots of building works, uh, building up for the, to, the, to the big event, lots of problems with the roads, uh, so a, a, a big mess before the, the actual event. And then another mess during the event, but that's, uh, that's something that we, we don't talk about, because everything was very beautiful and uh, people had fun, and uh, we had the games, and the stadiums, think Thank to God, not to the plan. They were ready in time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so now we have the big, the big stadiums ready. And uh, so during, the, par during the, the event, we had a great party until the party ended for us. And Angela actually had a great time in Brazil. And I don't know if, uh, if everybody here is aware, but Brazil lost 7-1 to Germany. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's painful, it still hurts deeply, <laughs> but unforgettable, certainly. This was our, our logo for the World Cup, and this is how it turned. <laughs> yeah, graphic design played a lot here. Yeah, so our, our logo was really, really well designed, and it was, it was really visionary. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so it was a perfect turn. And uh, yeah, but Actually, the World Cup gave us a huge, huge lesson. Um, we are talking about the plan. And after we had that awful loss to Germany 7-1, bad day for Brazilians, um, of course, a lot of discussion what happened. And uh, something came up that we actually, we didn't lose in football. No, of course not. We lost for, for a plan. We lost for a very good strategy. Uh, are there any Germans here? <laughs> Great. <laughs> You'll be able Excuse me? Hello. <laughs> Someone didn't like that I was going to talk about this. <laughs> so, uh, what happened and what was clear is that Brazil really didn't have a plan. Brazil was playing with just what they, they know what to do. Let's play football. But it's not only about football anymore. It's, it's, about, it's more professional, it's, uh, it's much better developed. And uh, looking at what Germany did, it was really brilliant, as we would expect, but uh, it was really a result of a plan, it was really uh, a good lesson for all of us. Uh, and that started not, uh, not recently, but that started actually about 10 years ago, um, since 2004, when Germany lost to Brazil in the World Cup, in the final, <laughs> by the way, and, uh, and when also did very badly in the Euro Cup. That was a bad performance. And because of the bad performance, it needed a plan to get better. And it was brilliantly done. Um, it was a plan that involved working with uh, the acad academia, working with the, the children and teenagers to 
find new talents, uh, changing management, uh, planning for, for a, a goal that was the World Cup again. Um, it included going to Brazil to play the World Cup, included a long-term capability development, that's about finding new talents, meticulous planning, uh, Germany was the only country that actually built their headquarters in beautiful scenery in Brazil, but strategically placed in the middle, four hours from all the, all the places where they had to play. So they had their own house there. Uh, they were very well equipped. They were, they were very well installed. So they, uh, they were able to prepare themselves to the matches, while the other teams were were running across the country, changing from hotel to another hotel, and finding hard to, to adjust to the different, we uh, different weather. Sorry. A collective over indiv individual stars. So while Brazil had Neymar, half Neymar, because he was injured halfway through, <laughs> um, so while we had ne Neymar and a few others, I can't remember their names even, uh, they had a whole team who were playing together. Even, uh, the plan goes even to the, to the strategy, for example, of teaching the children uh, the same type of uh, way, uh, the same way of playing football. So when they get together, when they come from the little schools, when they, when they meet together at the, at the team, at the big team, the big German team, they all play the same way. That makes sense, doesn't it? Like uh, in Brazil, no. In Brazil, you have one team plays one way, the other team plays the other way. And then it's, when they meet together, they're not a team. They are actually uh, competing with each other. Uh, competitive intelligence. They had people informing. They had scientists and um, uh, specialists, technicians, informing how to play. And local public campaign. They were really brilliant in getting Brazilians to actually support them. So it was not so hard to lose to Germany. Well, it was hard, okay, it was hard. But it was not that hard. If we had to, to choose someone to lose to, that would be Germany, certainly. And, uh, and so it was, uh, they had a public campaign. Some of the players were actually speaking Portuguese. And that was very charming. They actually got the Brazilian uh, supporters as well, what's important when you're playing in a World Cup. Uh, I'm telling you about sports and another story very similar from, we have from Great Britain. Great Britain did very badly in 1996 in Atlanta. They had actually only one gold medal. And they were going to host, they were already starting to think and starting to plan to host the Olympics in the UK. And uh, how could they host the Olympics and had one gold medal in their country? That couldn't happen. So they started a plan to change the situation. And uh, so we have 1996. Yesterday we had a, a challenge how to point out to both screens at the same time. And I have to say that's, the, that's impossible. So <laughs> on the bottom of the screen, 1996, in Atlanta, one gold medal, position 36. In 2008, you have in Beijing, it was already, uh, they were already in position four with 29 gold medals. And in 2012, position three in London. So how does it happen? How can, uh, how can you change the situation of one gold medal to 29 gold medals? That doesn't happen by chance. That happens by plan. And I'm talking to you about sports. Here is the, is the list of, uh, of strategies they had in the UK to change the situation in sports. That was a, a program called the World Class Performance Program. Um, and uh, when they invested uh, a, lot, a lot of money in, uh, to change the situation. And I'm talking to you about sports because it's easier to understand policy in this, in this context. Uh, it's easier to understand what policy can do. Policy is, about, is something that the government put together uh, to translate their political vision in, in actions to actually change the world. Desire changes in the real world. This is very important. Policy is about change. And uh, you can only make, uh, uh, create a change, uh, develop change, if you have a plan. What's design policy? Because design policy is a difficult thing to grasp. Uh, it's difficult to understand what it is. But it's about changing the situation or changing what you have, the, the, the scenery, 
in design, in the design area. And it's about using design resources, using everything you have in the country to encourage and encourage the effective use of design in that country. Uh, maybe you need to improve your design resources and uh, to be able to have better results through design. But it's all about using design resources to change uh, the situation in the country. Well, I have been, I have been working with design, uh, design policies, design programs for the past 18 years. And uh, during this time, I studied lots of different models, and I've worked with different uh, models, design programs, and uh, always trying to find uh, similarities and differences between them. Um, and there are lots of uh, there are lots of differences, lots of uh, of uh, contrasts. Uh, each country does in a different way, uh, immensely depending on on the resources, not only uh, uh, financial resources, but also people and uh, materials and uh, uh, installations depending on, on all these things. Uh, design policies, uh, I, we have here um, Finland, uh, the uh, uh, 1951, the great exhibition. We have India, the brilliant Indian report. Better by Design in New Zealand, the report from Finland. Um, South, uh, South Korea, brilliant uh, strategy. And UK, just a few, just to, to cite a few. One of the things that strikes me about design policy and that uh, influences the, the success of a design policy is actually the implementation. Is the capacity of making that policy or making that strategy a continuous plan. And I have here on this slide four, uh, four countries, showing four countries. This slide is from my, my research, my doctorate uh, research. I studied four countries, Brazil, India, Finland, and South Korea. And from these four countries, a big difference was the capacity of each country of uh, actually implementing a policy, implementing a strategy, and actually carry on revising that policy and making it better after five years and after 10 years, actually improving the plan that you had before. Um, if you see each, each bubble there is one stage. Uh, in Brazil, we are very good in having the first and the second stage. And that's it. Um, India, at the, time when I was, uh, at the time of this research, it's from 2009, um, the implementation wasn't in place yet. Um, we, will hear, we will hear about India tomorrow and maybe we will have a new perspective. Uh, in Finland, at this time as well, we, had, we actually had the complete, um, ins uh, the complete uh, implementation of the design policy 2005, design 2005. Um, but at that time, there wasn't yet a, r a review of the, or an analysis of the impact, and I needed design policy in place to, the, to continue the, the impact. And in South Korea, I think what's brilliant in South Korea is the fact that they revise the policy every, or the plan. Sometimes talking about policy is a bit heavy, but they actually revise a plan uh, every five years, every year, every five years, and, I, and then it's actually continuing growing and continually um, improving the same plan that they had. And that's, that's exactly what makes it better each time. If you, if you start from, from scratch every time, you, it's very difficult to get it better. So if you actually improve over what you have, it's, uh, it's much more likely that you have better results. So implementation is really important in terms of guaranteeing the success of your, of your policy. Um, and there are, there are two, well, it's very, it's very easy to, um, it's not so, uh, so immediate to divide in policy and programs, but we actually can consider that there are two types of implementation or two types of, uh, of um, strategies. You can talk about policy, you can talk about programs. Uh, policies, as Michael was, uh, was actually mentioning, sometimes it's difficult to think about policy because policy, policy is actually uh, something that the government has to lead. 
and uh, you can't uh, you can't have a policy from from the ground you have you can't have a policy from citizens you actually need the the government to back it up uh, and policy is about strategy it's about a long term vision uh, it's about differentiation programs are a bit easier you can uh, you can actually implement it doesn't need to, you don't depend on the government to start a program and it's about implementing a a policy will need programs and will need actions to get to get it actually work <laughs> to implement the policy or to implement the strategy programs can happen they can uh, they can be a set of programs without a policy in, uh, independent, independent independent from the policy and programs are about strengthening uh, strengthening what you have it can be anyone's initiative and Programs can be actually transferred. I've seen and I've worked in programs that we were actually transferring a practice from one country to another. And, and, and that's fine, that's fine, that works. You have to adapt to implement in your own country or in your, in your own region. But you can actually transfer programs, you can transfer practices from one country to another. Strategies or policies, you cannot transfer. Policies and strategies, we are talking about something unique to the country. We are talking about something that, will, uh, that has to identify your strengths or your weaknesses and work on those. Uh, you can't transfer a strategy from one country to another, even if it's a very similar country one to another. You can, you can, of course, have inspiration, but you cannot transfer. And so in order to develop uh, policy strategies, we really need to understand the context and determine what to change in that situation. Uh, this is very important, and this is everything about making a plan. That's what I want to stress in this presentation. We're talking a lot in the recent years, working uh, in my consultancy and working in Brazil, um, we're talking a lot about informed decision. Having, inf having information, having data to back up uh, your ideas or your, your plan, to back up your plan, to base your strategy on. And we, we are developing this type of uh, methodology or way to do it, uh, where we think about where are you, in this case, where is the country, where, where do they want to go? Uh, what are the goals? What's the long-term vision? Where are others? Where, where are the other countries? What kind of good practice or what kind of examples we have from others? And then how do we get there? What's the plan? So I want to bring to you this case from Uruguay that's quite recent, and uh, I can show you this step-by-step uh, -step through this case. It's a study for the implementation of the national design policy there. Um, through this methodology, where are you, where do you want to go, and how to get there, we implemented some tools. Uh, we used various tools that combined gave us uh, a good perspective or a good scenario about the situation in, uh, in Uruguay and about how to plan for the change. So first we started, where are we, setting the scene. So we had to learn, we had to go there, we had to learn what they're strong on, um, what's, uh, what type of resources they have, um, what they want for the future. Uh, Uruguay was, uh, was very focused at that time on, um, on exports. They kind of had this idea about exporting design, exporting design services and exporting design pro products. Um, they fought, they fought one of the strengths of the country were the design makers, so, uh, which would be uh, like small, small companies, startups, or designers who actually make their own products, and they thought that the important thing would be to export this type of service. So where do we want to go? Um, what, what are their goals, for, uh, their goals for the future? And where are the others? So we used benchmark, we used the scoreboard in some international references to work with them. Um, we had these diagnostics, 
here on the bottom, uh, on the bottom of the, the screen, the, on the right, your left, in this case. Um, this is a type of diagnostics we, we did with the industry. We used a questionnaire and uh, interviews with, uh, with the industry as well. We did some visits to understand where they are in the use of design, um, use of resources, design resources, and also to evaluate the, the actual design resources, the actual design consultancies, to evaluate uh, what uh, if they were if they had good uh, good performance? Not uh, not evaluating their portfolio, no, not uh, not that, but evaluating what type of techniques they use, uh, how much business they are generating, um, what's the portfolio of clients, uh, how they are connected with industry. That was our our key point to understand because we we did this uh, this research with the two groups, with design consultancies and, and industry, in a separate way. And then we, we had to cross-reference and try to understand if they were actually connected and if they were talking the same language, and if they were actually being able to work together. So we, we, used, uh, we used this reference, this, uh, this type of research, to understand where, what we were talking about there and what the problems were. Another thing that was very important was to map the, na the national design system. Um, why is this important? It's important because we're talking about policy. We're talking about uh, organizations, people. We need to get into that. We need to map who is doing what, um, if everything is being covered, if, uh, if we have enough resources, if we, if we have, if there are any gaps on the system. Um, when you map a national design system, we did the same in Brazil, you actually understand where if, the, if the associations are more present or if the associations are stronger or if they have representation. If the industry have, for example, someone who is working on the connection of designers with, uh, with uh, industry, uh, if there is a dialogue between designers and government. So actually you can see what's happening in that country. So mapping the national design system is very important. And if you have the opportunity to map the national design, the, the national innovation system, you can put together like a layer and, and see if there are connections or if they are completely separate. If you have different si uh, systems, different maps, for example, from industry, from the creative industries, you can see where the links are and if there are any missing links. So that's the importance of uh, mapping these systems. Uh, for example, sorry, when we mapped the, uh, this national design system, we found out that there were about four organizations that were actually doing very similar things and that were, uh, were actually confusing designers. So designers prefer to stay away from the, from the system or from the, the, the talks with government and with industry because they, f they found it very confusing. So one of the things that we had to do was to differentiate each organization and say which, what each one was going to do. And that was very well received there. And how to get there. If there is something that uh, an external consultant can't say is, uh, look, this is the plan, now go and do it. You can't, from, ex uh, from uh, being from another country, uh, you can't just go in a country and say, that's the way how you do it. You can't do that. Because there is a culture there uh, that has to be respected. There are, uh, there are ways to do things that you cannot, uh, you cannot ignore. And, uh, and there, are, there is always a history of things that they have tried before. And as, a, as an external consultant, you can't learn everything that they've tried before. Only there is a, a local knowledge that you have to respect and you have to account for. Uh, so what, what we do is to bring them ideas about how to work on some, uh, some strategy. And they tell you what's the best way to do it. And then we refine the plan. Um, so we, we always have a kind of a workshop to understand their, their views about, uh, about the plan that we are presenting. At this workshop, we present lots of different practices. Um, and then we ask them to classify if that's actually relevant to them, 
no, it, we won't do this, this, this doesn't uh, work for us, um, maybe, that's the third column there, and something that they are already doing or that they, they've done before and they tried. Um, so they classify the practices in, in different columns, and then we can understand what actually can happen to them, uh, can actually work for them. And, uh, and our plan will be much more assertive and much more um, adapted to the environment that we are working on. So in the end, we had a plan with, uh, with uh, various topics. That was, uh, the main thing about the plan was to work with communication and connection. Uh, in the beginning, they, they had this idea of uh, exporting design services. But after all the study we did, all the research, we understood that actually they shouldn't try, they shouldn't try to export their design services because their design resources were actually very good. Their design consultancies are actually very good design consultancies. And they were trying to export as the, as the government, as a government strategy. They thought that a good investment was to, would be to to incentivize or to help these companies, these design consultancies, to export their services. And, uh, and then we came in and we asked, but what about your industry? Your industry is not using the design resources. So you're actually going to export uh, a very important resource that you have in the country without keeping it here. Uh, your own industry is not making use of this good resource. Um, so one of our goals through this plan was to try to tell them how to connect industry with, uh, with designers in the country and try to make that happen. So we devised uh, a plan uh, that had lots of steps from showing industry what type of application design could have, for example, in, uh, in rural areas or with... Um, actually, because during the workshop they said, well, design is not very applicable here in the country because our type of industry wouldn't use design. And uh, that, that's something that we heard from, from design consultancies and from the government. And that's, that's, very, that's very bad because they can't see how design can be applicable in their own country, in their own industry. So one of the work that we had there, one of the, one of the tasks we had, was to show them how to apply design in their own industry, in their own uh, agriculture and um, uh, machinery, um, uh, industry that's, quite, uh, that's not, for example, an uh, end, end user. Uh, industry. The, it's not about designing only chairs or designing goods for the house. It's actually designing goods that will be used in other industries as well. So we had to work with them to change this idea and to, uh, to, to help them to understand how to, how to apply design in their own country, in their own industry. Um, another thing that was important was about creating a, a, design, a design organization that would connect industry and designers, and not necessarily a design organization that would work with designers only. No, but someone who would be next to the industry. Another thing that, was, uh, that we actually had to work with them was to show how to apply design in the creative industries, uh, because they were only understanding that design was part of the creative industries, but not that design, uh, design could be a supplier to the creative industries. And that was an important work we had. Uh, another thing was to show how design was applicable in government. There was something, uh, something very, very strange that uh, took me by, by surprise when we got there. That was about um, the fact that when you, when you graduated in, in Uruguay until recently, you, you would receive a diploma, not a graduation a degree. And, um, with that, you couldn't apply for jobs that needed a graduation. What happened? The fact was that the, in, in the government, most of the jobs were for people who were graduated. Being with the fact that designers were not graduated, designers couldn't work in certain jobs in government. And we asked, Aren't you, don't you think that this is, a, this is something that's um, prevailing designers from working together with government? And the answer was, no, but designers don't work in government, in government posi positions. And I said, well, 
Usually not, but that's, that's the problem. If, we, if designers were working in government positions, we would probably have a more creative government, we would, have, we would be able to develop better, better uh, strategies or more creative solutions to the country. And, uh, and then they said, oh, maybe, maybe not. Like, so try to, to, work, to work with them to change this type of pre preconceived ideas uh, was a big job for this strategy. So we, we devised this plan that was all about changing this culture and, and, and bringing international reference and trying to, to change the situation there. It was really a plan to change the scenery and to change the, um, what the position that they had about certain, certain ideas in relation to the uh, how you apply design in government and in industry. So this was the plan there. Recently in Brazil, it was a similar situation when they asked us to develop a diagnostics for Brazil. Because we, in, in Brazil, they are about to, uh, to develop a plan. But uh, finally, they realized that before des uh, designing a plan, before developing a plan, you need to know what you're planning for. You need to know what type of resources you have. Because then we didn't know for example, we didn't know how many design consultancies we have. And um, because it's, a, it's such a big, uh, a big country, and uh, we didn't have this number. Of course, it's not a precise number yet, but it's a start. So during this, uh, this diagnostics, during this, uh, this work, one of the things we did was to raise a campaign to, uh, for, for design offices, for design consultancies to register and uh, to try to understand how many, how many people we were talking about, how many people work in the design industry, um, what type of problems they have. And a number is just a number unless you cross reference with something else. Um, you can't say it's very, like, it doesn't mean much if you say Brazil has 683 design consultancies. But once you compare it with other numbers, with other countries, then you start having some sort of, um, some sort of uh, analysis or insights about what you can do with, the, with that number or what type of action you can take. So here, it will be difficult for you to read the, the, whole, the whole table, and that's not the, the intention, but it's to show that we, we use the, um, the International Design Scoreboard which is actually a, an old research. It's, uh, it's from 2009, 2009, from Cambridge, from Professor Motrier. And, um, well, in the lack of uh, anything, in the absence of any other um, more recent uh, research, we actually use this and we use others that have been, uh, been published more recently to, to try to make sense of our data. So here, we we compare the number of design consultancies from Brazil with other countries. We have there the number from Norway. Norway has actually more design consultancies than Brazil. Then, of course, you can say, uh, what, what does it mean? Uh, why Norway has more design consultancies than Brazil, if you compare the, the population of both? And, uh, but Brazil actually employs more people in the design industry than Norway. So we, from there, we understand that Brazil has larger design consultancies than Norway. If you go uh, more in depth, you can compare with other resources. Com for example, uh, the Global Competitiveness Report from OECD. And uh, then you start understanding if, for example, opening design consultancies is a problem. Uh, is it difficult for people to actually open a design consultancy? Is it what's preventing uh, the design industry from growing? Um, then we, we see that Denmark has more design consultancies than people working in the design industry, if you compare the, uh, the numbers from Denmark. And if you go on into the history of, uh, of design po of policies in, in Denmark, you see in the, in the 90s, there was a, a big campaign, a big um, uh, strategy to, to incentivize people to open, to open consultancies and to open startups. So it can be a result from that time when, when there was in, uh, incentives for people to open their own design consultancies. And indeed, 
Lots of these design consultants are startups. They are very small. And, and then, is it good or is it bad for the design environment uh, in a country to have more design consultants, or is it better to have large design consultants? So, when, once you have this information, you start working to, to see what's the best, the best solution for the country. Is it better to, ins to, uh, to provide incentives for companies to grow, for design consultants to grow, maybe with more expertise in one place, or is it better to have lots of different startups? Uh, here is, just, I'm not going to into this graph, but just to show that we cross-reference as well with, uh, for example, the Global uh, competitiveness, competitiveness Report. This is also part of the diagnostics in Brazil. We studied uh, nine, I don't think they're all here, but we studied nine different uh, industries, types of industries, uh, from footwear, ceramics, hygiene, uh, production machinery, uh, medical equipment, furniture, and fashion. There was also audiovisual. So we studied the different, uh, the different industries, the different sectors, to be able to provide information about each sector. And we found out some incredible uh, data and some incredible insights about how each industry works. For example, we were very, we were very surprised, sorry, but we were very surprised about finding out that uh, ceramic tiles is actually the, the, the most sophisticated industry in design management. Then uh, imagine, of course, ceramic tiles, they, they all compete on the same square, literally. Yeah? They all have to design the same square. And so it's very hard to compete uh, with ceramic tiles. So they really need design to compete in the market. And, uh, and they use different resources. They have in-house design team. They, have the, they also work with design consultants. They work with the freelancers, design management consultants, suppliers, and design schools. They work with the combination of all these different resources. And that's what makes them so sophisticated in design. It's actually the combination of various uh, resources. So having a, a, design, a design team, an internal design team, is not the full solution. You actually have to combine different resources in a way to have fresh design in your company, in a way to have a, the best use of design, and also work with design schools. So now we are able to, to um, guide our clients, our, our company, uh, the companies that are our clients, to actually um, have a variety of, uh, of um, of variety, variety of, uh, in their use of design, variety of actions to use design. And another thing that uh, really surprised us was that big bubble, that big, uh, big green bubble in the middle, it's the use, large use of freelancers in the hygiene and cosmetics industry. That's not good uh, from all the research we did. Using freelancers in uh, on this type of industry shows that uh, actually the freelancer is called in that last minute when you really need a, a packaging or you really need a, a label, so let's call a freelancer. So that's not building any know-how in the industry. And there are industries where this is even, even worse, this situation is even worse. Um, it's not here, one of the other sectors, but it's really a sector where you should be accumulating know-how internally, and the so the use of freelancers is not a good solution in that sector. So this is the type of work that we are doing. We are trying to understand with uh, ac accurate data what's actually going on in different sectors. Um, as part of the, the diagnostics as well, and this diagnostic this diagnostics is, uh, will be released in English very, very soon, now in December, I think, uh, was about um, evaluating how design is used for exports in the country. And this information is also part of the report. If you have interest, you can, you can access this, uh, this report later. Um, so what I'm talking about here is a, is a three-tier approach. We, Use actually from bottom up. We need it, we need data from bottom up. We need data from companies, from individual companies, to be able to inform the national design capability. If you don't have information from from companies, 
from the from industry you you're not talking about accurate data you're not talking about accurate information you're not talking about informed decision so we go into companies and we have we have a questionnaire we have a way to collect data from them and which is very hard you you probably who works with research here know how difficult it is to to get information to get data from companies so what we do is to offer them an individual diagnostic there on the bottom on the bottom right for you you have we we give them a, an individual diagnostic that we in, in exchange to uh, to the data uh, so they are they're more keen to provide us information and to provide uh, data about their, their practices. On the second tier, we have industry. This type of research has been really useful for sector associations, for specific industry sectors, because they learn what's going on with their companies, how com their own companies use design. Because the strategy for the ceramic sector will be completely different from the strategy to another sector because they, are they have different problems and providing this type of data they can go exactly into the problem into the where you're lacking information and then we can inform uh, countries or the national government so the information data has to come from bottom up and then of course the actions and programs will come from top down so this is, uh, this is where, with DoCount, it's, uh, it's online-based, we found that this would, uh, would be very useful for collecting data. So companies can, uh, can provide us their, their information, and we can give them back uh, diagnostics. And uh, it makes much easier to collect data and to work with, uh, with associations. Um, so just to close the, to go back to sports and show, make this link. If a sport is managing to to make changes, so what can we learn from their uh, from their practice? Uh, the first thing I want to show you was about their meticulous planning. To highlight, to conclude here, was their meticulous planning for long term for long term results. So, for example, Germany was able to build their own headquarters, was able to make a plan, a 10, years, a 10 year plan, and get to, a, and actually get to their objective, that was, in this case, was the World Cup. So this kind of meticulous planning is very important. I, I talked here about South Korea, that had the, the plan that's revised, often uh, revised, and uh, this is the type of uh, information that I'm talking about, this type of, uh, the type of practice I'm talking about. And, uh, and the, the plan that we had for, uh, for Uruguay, that's, um, we had priorities. So in one year, what are the goals for one year, for three years, for five years, and then for 10 years? Um, typically, it takes about eight years to form, um, to form an athlete. So that's important. That's why it's important to start early. You actually have to form people in order to get a result in the end. Um, Mood fast approach is the fact of having information from different areas. If we only work in the design bubble, we don't get very far. Um, in the case of, uh, of uh, sports, for example, they really need to work, to work with sports psychologists, for example. The German team had Brazilian team didn't. So after the first goal, they were, oh, where do we go now? The second goal, my God, the third goal, chaos. And then they got to the seventh goal and then forget it. But uh, so if uh, that's why it's important to work with other areas. You have to be modest. You have to be, uh, to have the, uh, the simplicity or the, you have to be open for other expertises to come and work with you. Statistics, for example. Um, they work with the whole team. The importance of mapping the whole design system and to match the design system with other systems, with innovation system, with industry network. And to finish here, the story of the competitive intelligence. So what I want to highlight through this presentation was the importance of data, the importance of having informed decision. You need to have data and you need to have um, to have argument, you need to know what you're doing in order to 
uh, make your plan more assertive. It's a big investment to make a design program. It's a big investment for a government to, to design a policy and to commit to, to such investment. So it's important to make the government uh, very, very confident about that investment. It's important to, to be able to measure your, uh, your impact. So we are using that type of diagnostic to measure how the company is when it enters the program and how the company is when it leaves the program. And then with this gap, measuring the difference between the entrance and the, the way how the, the company leaves the program, we can, say, we can talk about the impact. And this has made a, uh, a lot of difference when we speak to governments. Um, okay, so this is what I want to bring for you. I hope, that you, I hope to, to be able to give you some insights through this presentation. And uh, I'll be here through the next two days in case you have any questions, because now we have the next presentation, don't we? Okay, thank you very much.